It's great to be here. Uh, I'm not an advocate. I am a, the president of the Signal Foundation and an AI scholar, but this is a, an issue of existential concern for us. And so we're here trying to set the record straight and trying to share as much as we know about the threats to private communication. So as you're aware, we're in the midst of a storm of global attacks on the human right to privacy with governments, security services, AI companies masquerading as NGOs, and a lot of money with very little transparency, hard at work trying to walk back the few safe havens we've been able to carve out against the ferocious surveillance business model and the states that skim off of it. Now, I've been in tech for almost 20 years, and I've worked on issues relating to privacy on and off throughout. I've watched many government challenges to encryption. But I have never seen anything as untethered from reality or as willfully misleading as the campaign that I'm seeing now. I just came from the UK, which is informing my perspective here, and, it's lead and, and which is the UK, is leading the charge against encryption and the right to privacy. What I witnessed there is genuinely alarming. Anti-intellectualism and propaganda define both the popular and even much of the so-called ex expert discussion. Glassy-eyed fervor seems to have displaced discourse with emotionally wrenching imagery of abused children evoked regularly as a powerful conversation stopper. An air of hysteria and menace hangs over any attempt at meaningful discussion, including discussion of evidenced approaches to actually help children that go beyond the fixation on online surveillance. And this makes it scary and difficult to defend human rights when the implication is that in doing so, you're defending demons and monsters. Now, under these harsh conditions, democratic deliberation over this incredibly serious affront to rights was stunted, and I don't believe this is accidental. This air of hysteria provides cover for the uncomfortable fact that the tech to do the thing they're legislating does not exist in any workable form. In spite of what the organizations marketing it claim, this, it is not possible to scan everyone's encrypted communications in order to flag banned expression safely and securely, full stop. To say otherwise is magical thinking. But even under these chilling conditions, many in the UK did speak up and say as much. The human rights community, the academic expert community, civil rights organizations, and many others in the UK were vocal in the lead up to the bill's passage. Amnesty made clear that their global work would be endangered by any move to undermine end-to-end -end encryption. Since communication does not stay within a given jurisdiction, vulnerable people living under authoritarian surveillance whom Amnesty communicates with and helps would also be at risk, even if it were only undermined in the UK. Stonewall, an LGBTQ advocacy and service organization, made a similar point, referencing their global work and the 64 countries in which LGBTQ identity is criminalized. And many familiar with Ukraine, whose government uses Signal as core communications infrastructure, expressed similar concern. Now, a united chorus of experts also spoke to the misguided marketing and AI hype on which the bill's assumptions about scanning end-to-end -end encrypted communications are based. The Refrain Independent Research Center, which was appointed by the UK government to review AI scanning prototypes proposed for such use, took the highly unorthodox step of declaring that these tools were not fit for purpose, echoing longstanding expert consensus. Even Apple Incorporated, the trillion dollar market cap monopoly that in 2021 briefly deployed client-side scanning for encrypted data before their system was found to include serious vulnerabilities, came out publicly and said that, having tried it, they now recognize that it is not possible to build such a system that is both safe and secure. Indeed, by the end of the process, even the UK government itself was forced to acknowledge that no tech exists that can safely and privately scan end-to-end -end encrypted communications. But what was chilling to me is that even with the UK government's acknowledgement, the bill moved forward. Multiple people I spoke with in government simply waved their hands. Political inertia would move irrespective of the dangers, damages, and folly, they said, looking into the middle distance. What we were told is that the Home Office wanted the bill and the power it gave them to undermine encryption. 
So even with the pretext falling apart, with the claims being fact-checked into oblivion and the bald opportunism showing, the bill moved. And in the process, it exposed serious cracks in the UK's democratic foundations. Now, the EU has a chance to stop this tide and to turn away from the clownishness that defined this in the UK. And if it doesn't, I don't really know what we'll do, because the EU's stamp of approval on such a profound setback to human rights would open the door for everyone else. I don't come from a country where we can trust our institutions with the peace of mind that you do here. In the US, a woman named Jessica Burgess and her daughter are now in prison, having been sentenced to, to, a fe to felony charges for accessing criminalized reproductive care in the state of Nebraska following the Supreme Court decision. Facebook messages turned over by the company were key evidence used to convict them. A wave of book banning continues to sweep many US states, and in a few cases, librarians are being threatened with criminal action for providing proscribed literature. A law in Florida proposed that any journalist covering local politics be forced to register with the state, and Senator Marsha Blackburn has worked with one of the authors of the UK's online safety bill to transpose it into US law. She recently suggested that scanning should be expanded to include LGBTQ content. So for me, the slippery slope is not hypothetical. Of course, the EU should not be entirely trusting of ins institutions either. Wherever these laws are being pushed, there are many interested tech companies, often posing as NGOs, and governmental departments that cannot wait to expand their profits and or power. According to recent investigative reporting, Europol is already making the case for expanding scanning to the commission, saying, quote, there are other crime areas that would benefit from detection, end quote. Now, according to meeting minutes, the response from commissioners was not horror, but a note of strategic caution, telling Europol that it, quote, needs to be realistic in terms of what could be expected given the many sensitivities around the proposal, end quote. Now, if institutional wariness is warranted in the context of government, which it is, suspicion of the companies peddling AI hype as a way to solve harm to children is downright required. It's deeply ironic that the same government that is pushing to lead on meaningful AI regulation with the AI Act and the DMA is also falling so hard for baseless AI hype when it comes to children. And yes, AI hype is the most accurate description of the marketing and unsubstantiated claims being made around client-side scanning for end-to-end -end encryption. Just last week, the AI company Thorn, which disguises itself as an NGO, pitched a webinar to market AI tech for undermining end-to-end -end encryption to, UK e to, sorry, to EU politicians. You can tell I've been back and forth. This webinar included a whole session dedicated to bringing AI company CEOs to discuss quote, solutions to detect end-to-end -end encrypted environments, end quote. But because this was framed as an intervention to protect children, it was not treated with the skepticism that meets most other tech lobbying. Dragonfly AI, one of the companies invited to market their tech in the webinar by Thorne, has ties to the biometrics giant Yoti, one of the companies uh, Dragonfly claimed without evidence that their tech, quote, allows nudity and age to be detected together within end-to-end -end encrypted environments, end quote. Now, again, let's be clear, no such tech exists that can do this. The tech that's been built, including Dragonfly AI's products, have been panned as unworkable, error-filled, and ultimately unsafe and privacy-invasive. The companies peddling these services, some of them incorporated as NGOs, as we've mentioned, but all of them aiming for revenue, are selling technical solutions to social problems and offering the security services a much coveted backdoor to end-to-end -end encryption in the process. They have lobbying and astroturf operations that look nothing like organic civil society engagement, and, but very much like big tech influence operations. They marshal millions of dollars in hard-to-trace funding to shape the political process to an alarming degree. And in the case of the EU, according to this recent reporting, some members of government are willing participants collaborating with these companies and their networks in highly conflicted ways. This is serious. It doesn't matter how many times you say it. AI is not conscious, it's not superhuman, and AI-based scanning cannot both maintain privacy and security and surveil all private communications. It is a regulator's duty to know this. 
Now, with the smoke clearing and the financial influence operations of those pushing to undermine encryption for profit and power are be becoming clearer, I am cautiously hopeful that the EU can be where this wave of attack stops. Because if this wave of legislation takes hold be beyond the UK, it's not clear that Signal could survive. Just as our commitment to provide a tool for meaningful private communications does not change based on re region, our position on this legislation, whether it's the online safety bill's spy clause or the chat controls legislation, does not change. As in the UK, as in Iran, as everywhere, we will continue to do everything in our power to ensure that people in the EU, EU have access to signal and to private communications. But we will not undermine or compromise the privacy and safety promises we make to people in the EU and everywhere else in the world. And we will never, ever install a backdoor or otherwise undermine the encryption that keeps the people who use signal safe. We would rather leave. I want to close by thanking Edri for their hard and essential work and for doing this work in the face of such ugly and cynical rhetoric and the big textile influence operation that while not a new tactic is shocking in that it seems to, impl to implicate not just AI companies like Thorne but interested European politicians. There is clearly hard work to be done but I believe when the facts are clear and public we can win and I thank you for your work. Thank you. Meredith, we're running slightly over, so I'll have to ask you to, to be brief in the response, but this is an important question. The commissioner earlier mentioned that this debate is almost as old as the internet itself. You've also worked for many years on this. What do you think is different about it this time? Why is it that bit more difficult and complex? Yeah. I mean, governments have been weird about encryption since 1976 when public key encryption debuted. In the 90s, when the internet was being commercialized, they, you know, this uneasiness launched into panic as they wanted to prevent people from having means to transact or communicate without their surveillance. And you know, since then, we have seen fits and starts and restarted attempts to undermine encryption, whether it's 2010 with the FBI and Apple, or 2017 with the bombing on the bridge and David Cameron calling to end encryption. So this is not new. But what is new, in my view, is that we now have an industry government coalition pushing to undermine encryption. So you have an AI industry wanting to sell scanning services, you have the biometrics industry behind them, and in the past it had been an uneasy coalition of human rights, civil society, and most tech actors on the side of encryption against security services and potentially vendors who were not. And now we see this expanding to something that looks a lot more like an, a big tech operation on the other side. And I think that is the key difference, that we're now dealing with industry actors who've disguised themselves as NGOs and set up astroturfing operations to make it look like they have an organic coalition, where if we look at the reporting, um, none really exists. So. Thank you. That's a really important point. And thank you so much for joining us and bringing your international perspective and expertise to that. 